Don't worry about it. It's Whatever. Dust. This is no, it's dust. Like, it's like dead old skin protein. cells. You know, dead skin, old, yeah. That's old what protein. I like that. It's like old protein. It's old protein. Stepping. You, <laughs> you get young protein, and you know they'll they'll lock you up. You like young protein? I got. I just. Do you like? I was gonna remain quiet. It's okay, my friend. <laughs> it's good. It's okay, it's good. It is good. So when do we want to start? We already started um, recording, right? Like, oh shit! So what all about right. what about the film? What's up, guys? We're good. Oh well, thank you, uh-huh. Joe. Letting me know. None of none of, none of, that. None of that. No. <laughs> okay. So So intro? Intro. We're live. And we're live. And Go we're for live. it. Welcome to Keepers of the Word. We're an esoteric study group of Freemasons whose purpose is of sharing knowledge of mystery schools and debunking misconceptions about Freemasonry. You're here with Mike and Ron. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, we also got James here. Of course. How's it going, guys? Kazak listener, make sure you follow him. Thank you. Any of the opinions expressed on Keepers of the Word do not reflect the opinions of other organizations or Masonic lodges. So we are here with uh, Sterling Knight, who is uh, going to give us a good uh, background and uh, backstory on Nordic mythos and runes. Hello, Sterling. Can you give us a quick uh, background? On introduce where, you yourself. Know, introduce and yourself and, and all that good stuff. Uh, sure, let me try here anyway. Um, I've been working with um, Nordic runes, if you want to term them that, uh, since the middle uh, 80s, so th- that's been an incredibly long time. <laughs> when did I get to be the guy that did things 40 years ago? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my God. Shh. Yeah, don't t- when you look <laughs> at it from a time perspective, yeah, it's... Don't. <laughs> We don't. Won't, we won't focus on that. Don't tell anyone about that. Um, well, it, it's kind of a, a, a separate uh, mythos, a t- separate approach uh, to life from a lot of uh, things that are in the Hermetic world or the Kabbalah or anything like that. And it's, you know. It was a pretty isolated area in a lot of ways, so it really was very different. Um, the way I approach things is very different from um, a lot of uh, common pagan paths nowadays. Uh, they seem to blend everything together uh, so that it's almost homogenous, and it depends, you know, what name you want to pull out of a hat, uh, and everything else fits. Uh, this is this is very different. The stories are different. Uh, the ways of working are, are very different. Uh, they're based around what we have anyway, uh, because an awful lot was lost. Most of it, unfortunately, was lost uh, through history. What we have is a couple of different systems of runes, of groups, uh, the one I use mostly is what's called the Elder Futh Ark. Uh, that's a group of 24 runes. Uh, most people see those as, l- as little glyphs. Um, and that's a good place to start, I suppose. And you were talking about earlier that the actual symbols or the glyphs on those runes are not the actual are not what the runes are. So what are the runes? The runes are uh, an energy. Each rune is a separate energy of a type. I'm, it uh, encompasses a lot of different things, uh, and it, uh, in some ways it's situational, simply because it has such a, a complex, large aspect. You're basically taking the entire m- universe and cutting it into 24 pieces. So any of those pieces is going to be huge. It's going to cover a whole lot of things that will only really become important in certain circumstances, you know. Um, just the way that uh, whether or not it's raining gets important when you got to go out there, but if you're, st- you're staying at home all day, not such a big deal. Um, the shapes of them, uh, the drawings of them aren't, important. It's the concepts, the energies behind them that are important. Uh, Unlike tarot cards, which are really very different 
and really are Kabbalistic. Um, the colors really aren't there. Uh, for the most part, it's considered traditional that the drawings themselves of the runes are in red, uh, mostly because that symbolizes blood, and it was traditionally reddened with the person that was creating mm -hmm. these runes' blood. Blood magic. Yeah. <coughs> uh, but aside from that, uh, you know. And did that have, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, did, does that have something to do with the life force behind the blood energy like most ancient? You, you, you definitely do have some of that. Um, there's also back in back in you know uh, 1,000 years ago, 1,200 years ago, you couldn't roll out and pick up a nice ink someplace. <laughs> you know, yeah. you were kind of limited. Um, Speak a little closer. <laughs> yeah. Um, to the mic. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm it's sorry. That's right. right. Kick the gain up. We'll get this. Um, so what you what you had was what you had to work with. Uh, normally, when you see runes nowadays, they're disc shaped, or people will use stones uh, and and grind a, a rune into them. Uh, back then, chances are uh, they didn't look a whole lot like that. Uh, tools were much more basic. Uh, very commonly, from what we do have as a record, is you would take a twig off a tree, use your knife, and cut it at an angle so you had a flat spot, and you would carve your runes into that. So they looked very different. Um, somewhat more like a, an, an ice cream stick, you know, that you'd right. you know, get or with a flat. Plop. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, just a flat piece and angled, because that's what you could do really quickly and easily. Um, so it was, it was very different. Uh, like I say, you couldn't couldn't go out and get much in the way of colored ink, and you couldn't, uh, you know, you don't have the access to the kind of things that you do nowadays, where you can get really ornate. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do them in precious metals. You can do them however you like. My personal set, as we discussed, is antler. I like the uh, natural feel to it. Uh, they hold up pretty well. I have seen a few people who have had, uh, they were either stone or glass mm -hmm. runes, uh, do a casting and they break. You know, because oh. you know, you're throwing these things right. around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't had that problem with wood. I haven't had that problem with antler. And I used to make runes out of leather, which I can guarantee you will not break. Right. Okay. <laughs> And th so they're forever. Um, yeah, I've only used bone and wood. Mm -hmm. I've never used anything else than that. Is there is there a different energy or a different a different rune to creation out of bone versus glass or wood or? I really haven't found it. So I like the the natural material. That that always seems good to me. Um, as opposed to, I, I've seen people make make them out of uh, thin pieces of plywood, you know, and they work. Kay. You know, it's just not my preference. Uh, some of that is just personal, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I've always liked the heavier ones because they seem to lay easier and faster. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I find a difficulty with uh, the gemstones is that they're rarely flat. And what do you do when you toss them and you come up with a rune that's halfway there? Right. You know, it's it's like this fifty is, fifty. You know? This <laughs> is getting this is getting a little <laughs> silly. Um, not to mention, I doubt that they have any real traditional value because, you know, trying to cut a, a rune into a stone would be difficult. You know, when your tools are are limited. Mm -hmm. You know, to I guess what. Uh, saws and knives, you know, probably what the technology, what the technology allows. Technology. Yeah, you didn't have a, you didn't have a rotary tool with a diamond bit. Right. You could have, you know, go to town with it. Yeah. Uh, so, a different way of working. 
Where did you Where did you see the origin of the runes come from? Is there a specific time where they where they're talked about, or did they, were they always there? Uh, the runes were uh, captured, if you will, by Odin, mm -hmm. according to story. Uh, the if you read in the uh, uh, poetic Edda, uh, portion of that is what's called the Havamal, yes. and the Havamal describes Odin's uh, shamanic uh, quest for the runes, uh, where he sacrifices himself uh, by impaling himself on a tree with a spear. Can you elaborate on that really quick? Like, how? Why did he do that? So he was there for how long before he decided to do Nine that? Nine days. He was there nine days. Nine and, days. And the reason why he did that was because? Because in a lot of ways, this was, again, remember, uh, in the time, a lot of the religion was very shamanic in nature. Uh, you didn't have cathedrals. You didn't have written down rituals and a hierarchy. Uh, you went to the guy who knew how to get things done. And they tended to operate in a very shamanic way. And a death quest was a very common way to get past yourself, to leave yourself right. behind. Kill like the an, ego. Like an ego death. Kill the ego. Kill the ego. Mm -hmm. uh, go beyond that. Right. And sometimes you can bring something back. Right. Sometimes not. Right. Uh, sometimes you don't come back. I felt it as though when he was on the tree, he was almost impatient. Well, it was nine days. I guess it's not nine impatient. Days. He was pretty patient. That he wanted to, to get over to the, the line. He did. And uh, the Havamal speaks of that, that he was there for nine days. Uh, no food, no water. Nobody mm -hmm. helped him. Nobody... Brought him somebody. Put himself, put himself there. Put correct? himself there. He put himself yeah, there. Yeah, and how was, was he hanging was in, in the tree? Hung from the tree. He hung, hung from the right tree. From the neck. No, he from was the, the spear. The spear. Okay, gotcha. And the spear. Um, but the, the 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 mechanics of it really aren't that important. The important thing is that he did go through this, and he did uh, capture the runes at the end of it, and brought them back, and taught them to select people with mm -hmm. and it's spread since then uh, that's where they came from uh, so when, when we're talking about how did he when he went and he acquired these where did he go or where, where do you think he went uh, again according to the Havamal he was hanging from the world tree Yitzrasil, right. uh, which uh, interestingly enough Yitzrasil means the horse of Odin mm. right and uh, this is, if you look at the cosmology of the Norse uh, world, you had a central tree with nine worlds coming off of it. Um, so when you are at Yggdrasil, you're at the core of the, center. the multiverse, <clears throat> if you will, of all, all the I hesitate to say creation because it really isn't a creation mythos, but uh, all that there is, you're at the center of it. Kind of the, the 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 concept of the beginning of creation, the the focal point that that one time isn't really at time isn't really addressed in this. Okay. Um, if you look at the Norse mythos, Odin was not the first being. Odin did not create the world. You know, you went through a series of different things, uh, and it, it gets a little it gets a little lengthy. But you had the land of ice, land of fire, the place in between where things happened, uh, and uh, different beings were, I suppose, spontaneously appeared in there. Um, Odin was fourth generation, I think it is. Depends where you where you start counting. Um, so he was not the creator. No, he no, was not the wasn't. creator. But uh, you were saying earlier that they're the, within the mythos. There's not really. It's kind of that concept. They all just of, existed. Right? Yeah, they, there is the a universe day. was is, and always shall be. There was, there was nothing mirror? outside that created the universe. Um, it's simply given that this is what's here. Uh, doesn't get real specific. Um, that's Which the starting point was. The cow you mentioned? That was the first being. Okay. The first being at Humla, the cosmic cow, um, whose milk fed the giants. Right. Who uh, 
Um, I don't know if she's still out and around. Probably. <laughs> she got, and then so they got strong by them. The Milky yeah. Way was, you know, Ooh. the trails of her, of her milk. The milk. Okay. Uh huh. Um, how much of that is original, and how much of that has been tacked on in the ongoing centuries? Pretty hard to tell. Mm. But um, so Odin wasn't wasn't that. Uh, he is called the All Father. Um, but in a lot of ways, that's more of a title than a factual. You know, um, if you look at the Greek uh, pantheons, you see Zeus really is you the, know, father. the father of all right. these different beings. Um, and Odin, that's not really said. There's only a couple of uh, gods that are really referred to as Odin's children. Um, yeah, and you're talking about ones that most people don't even talk about, like Baldur, mm-hmm. uh, right. Thor. Um, so it, he really wasn't a progenitor god that's walking around spreading his wild oats all about. He right. was intelligent. Right. Uh, but there is, there is tradition uh, that says that some people are descended from uh, the line of Odin. Uh, there's no real specificity for most of it. Uh, most of the royal houses of what are now the Scandinavian country uh, they have that kind of mythos in them, um, th- that they are descended from from Odin, which isn't surprising. I mean, that's right. what our that's what our cultures do. That's King, pretty common. Kings, kind of rulers are from the right. gods and right. have right. the right to rule. Because, and it, this is their right. right to rule. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that really wasn't common way back in what we consider the Viking era, uh, because Kings were not the European monarch type. Uh, the king was the, the guy with maybe 20 guys who beat up the last guy. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. It, this, this that's is, what was in charge. That's what it was right. like. And this is and it's very common. In, they were thugs. A lot of they people. were they thugs. Oh, yeah. And they wrote the history after they became well, in, in, they in had place. This, they that. had the skalds, you know, tell the story. Correct. Nobody was writing a whole lot back then. Right. But this is this is common in uh, the British Isles. Anywhere. This yeah. is why if, if you ever get any Irishman in the world and you feed them two drinks, they will tell you how they were descended from kings. And they probably <laughs> were because there was a king And the Scottish were better than the Irish and the Welsh right. were better than both of them. And right. Yes, and so right. on. And so right. And none of them ever won a war, but they fought like hell every time you turned around. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah. The, 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 all the tales of all the kings, yeah, because there were kings all over the place. You know, if you could, uh, if you could hold a certain amount of territory that seemed good to you, I'm a king. I'm a king. <laughs> I'm a king, and I imagine that was pretty common, although the, the the terms were different. I'm not I'm not sure of the etymology of king, um, but uh, well, Jarl. These were, these were, Jarl. Yeah, the Jarl. Yeah. These, these were warring tribes at the time, so you know, there really wasn't. What we would think of as as king today, like the kings of England, you know, that was completely different in that it the was, Germanic it, it tribes. Was a feudal, it was more of a feudal, like like the hierarchy of like the of the Scottish Highlands, where it was the chieftain of the tribe, right? Yeah, more, yeah, more like that. It, it, the we had the bigger axe one. Right. He's king. <laughs> he's, he's king. He's king. He's king now. He, he can kick my butt. I guess he's going to be king. Um, back then, remember, these places were not very highly populated. Um, people only came into the Scandinavian countries in the last 30,000 years. You know, it's not like around the Mediterranean. Right. Because all of that was under, under ice. It was under ice. Uh, not until the, that last little ice age pulled back that people started going up there. Um, so it's it was relatively new. Um, so do you think the mythos about people coming out of the ice was connected? Was somehow? connected mm-hmm. to that, or it's, it's it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Um, Remember, these are all handed down verbally, yeah. and mouth at ear. It changes. Yeah, yeah. It, it it all changes. Uh, the mythological content of it is is much more important and relevant than the any kind of factual 
content could realistically be. Um, you had encroaching ice. Most of, the, most of these mythos, though, you have to understand, they didn't really happen, they didn't form so much in Scandinavia. They formed in Iceland. Okay, and Which if you go... Because that's pretty far from, the, you know, but Norway this, and Denmark. But this is, this is the place that they were preserved. Right. Okay, most well, they of had the, a lot of time, right, to well, sit there. And no, the, 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 remember that these were, the stories that survived for the most part were collected by uh, usually Christian monks of one type or another who were collecting what they saw as folklore. Okay, and they thought it was important that they preserve it, and that's how they that's how they approached it. Uh, when you go to Iceland, you'll see things there that you'll not see any place else, like volcano, ice. <laughs> okay, we have glacier, we have volcano, we have a, a volcano coming out of a glacier. This is truly a place. It, it's where the it's the one place above the ground where the two plates, tectonic plates, meet. And it's a very, very volcanic area. And because of its location so far north, it's also very heavy on the ice. Uh, so when you say fire and ice, there it is, mm -hmm. right there in front of you. And these are the stories that were preserved. Now, are they the same ones that were told in Sweden and Norway? We really don't know. Yeah. It could have changed by the time it got out. Could have there. changed radically. Yeah. Could have changed radically. Wow. Uh, Snorley Sturluson, who did a whole lot of this, was doing his work, I believe, uh, right around 1200s. late 1200s. So that was a good time past the Viking era. What we think of, you know, when Ragnar was running around with his axe and, you know, being generally obnoxious, right? <laughs> drinking up, rape, the pillage, and drinking yeah. the skulls. Drinking all, all that. <laughs> he was just trying to find a place to farm. That's yeah, all he that's was. All right. he wanted to do that's, was plow. That's all he was. Seriously, right. that was fun. everything though. That was food. Yes. I could eat then. This was important. Uh, the growing season back then is even worse than it is now. You know, you've got a couple of months to get the rest of the crops ye ready. Rest to of the year's crops done. Yeah. So you you had to really make it happen. Um, very different conditions than what we're seeing now. But but Sturluson's stuff was what he found in Iceland. You know, so that was mostly That's Norwegian. Where it's been preserved. That was where he that well that was where he was, and you know that's the ones that he walked around and said, "So tell me this story," and I wrote it down. Um, just the same way, if you look at. Uh, the the well-known Grimm tales, you know, for the Brothers Grimm. And Brothers Grimm. Uh, Jacob and... I can't remember, can't remember the last the other one. But they were doing that in Germany. Okay, and you can see crossover between, you know, what Sterlison recorded and what the Grimm brothers did, but there's a lot of variance. And the Grimm tales were recorded much later. You know, so they had all this other stuff mixed in, you know, but again, the, the important part is the mythic content. You know, not was it was it really on Tuesday? I think it was Thursday. You know, but what, what is the mythic content of it? That's that's what's important. That's what's still relevant, and that's why we still tell them today. Yeah, the mythos definitely has its own importance aside from whatever the the science or the factual hmm. portions behind the history is i mean mythos has its 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 own energy it does it does and it's relevant to a different part of uh, the human life um science which i thoroughly support i'm working on a degree in mathematics right now um is is what it is you know it's a it's a collection and categorizations of observed provable facts uh, and you can have a really nice creation mythos, and it's probably not going to be supported by modern day science. Correct. Uh, that doesn't mean it's useless and you're stupid to, you know, use it, because it does have a mythic import to you. It does have mythic content that's important, uh, and different ones have different approaches, and you should uh, be able to appreciate those for what they are. 
and not try to make them into hard science, which they're never going to be. You know, if somebody wants to roll up to me and say, I can prove that your creation mythos is not scientific, I, I'll agree with them. You know, now, I, in, in, the, in the runes, you know, when they were used back in, back in that time, they were used during wartime, they were used to yield crops. Today and now, how are they used? Well, they're used in a bunch of different ways, depending on the person using them. The most uh, basic way is uh, usually it's what I would call fortune telling, which to me is different from divination. Uh, fortune telling is telling somebody a good story for the most part. Hopefully it gives them a different viewpoint on what they're doing. You know, um, you'll see somebody, the most common probably is tarot cards. You see this happen all the time. You go to a fair or a psychic and you, you pay to have a reading and you ask, well, if you're like everybody asks, you ask two questions. Where am I going to get some money and how am I going to get some loving? These are that's ninety. Right. That's ninety five percent of what of, money of what you're loving. That's money it. Money and loving. That's it. That's ninety five percent of what you get asked uh, if you ever work money. in a fair. Love and cost money. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you get the money it. first. You get loving, and then you lose the money. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. yes. You know, but yes. Uh, and 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 they'll sit there and they'll shuffle their cards and they'll try to come up with something that's relevant to you. Um, there's a great deal of variance and how adept they are in right. doing this. Uh, some people are, there are people out there doing this as a complete scam. And there are people out there that have studied and uh, worked at it and are trying to do a good job. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Could you give a tip to somebody who's try attempting to really put a good foot forward and attempt to do this? Any, any guidelines or a, a tip? Attempting to do readings? Readings or runes? Um, don't take yourself too seriously, right. okay? Because you're sometimes you're going to be right on, and sometimes you're going to be way out down right. the road. Um, study whatever it is that you're using for this, and be serious about it, and approach it seriously. Right. Um, the intent needs to be the, there. The intent needs to be there. Now, if you're somebody that's out there and doing a reading, because I I want to tell you something horrible is going to going to happen to you in the next two weeks, but you're lucky because for $2,000, I can fix that for you. I can right. help you avoid it. Right. Okay. So I can help you avoid Snake it. Snake oil. Wink, oh. wink. Oh, yes. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> this candle, it was blessed by somebody, and right. do whatever. Yeah, there, there are people that do that. Um, and for the most part, it's as it, it's, it's fraudulent. Yeah. <laughs> it's fraudulent. The way I think... Uh, Alejandro Jorodowski explained it was uh, the guy who did Holy Mountain. Um, he explained the tarot as if you're doing if you're doing that to teach the future, you're a charlatan. But if you're doing that to teach the present right now, what you're doing right now, then you're telling the truth because at that person's reacting to those cards as you're telling them, and you're getting real feelings at that moment in the present of what Correct. they're going through, and then you're able to guide mm -hmm. from that point. But if you're trying to tell them, oh, no, in the future I see you know, you're going to make some money, you're going to meet this woman, and <laughs> this is going to happen. And, you know, that's where the whole Bullshit. BS part right. comes into play. <laughs> yes. It, yes. It, you know? it can. It, it definitely can. Um, now, what I call divination, and this is why I separate it from fortune telling, divination is when you are going into whatever tool you're using, runes, tarot is, can be used, and you're going into it deliberately in a specific way for personal growth, for personal insight, uh, to use it as a bridge to talk to your deity, your holy guardian angel, whatever your term may right. be for that. You're using it in a going spiritual evolution. Right. And that's very different from doing uh, a divination. Uh, uh, rather fortune telling divination is when you try to talk to uh, however you see uh, a higher power a god a goddess many terms same same basic thing 
Um, I have spent too much time arguing about terms. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a great way. Over it's a couple Odin. of beers, it's you Odin. Can, yeah, you can get in all oh, kinds man, of messes. All kind of stuff. Oh, sure, man. absolutely. Such a mess, and it's meaningless. That's how we got here. It's 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 like an <laughs> it's like an argument on Facebook. What the heck? Right. You know, it's not. No one's solving anything. No one's convincing anybody. Um, it's so a, that's uh, that's the that's the way you start with with. Uh, runes in this case since we're speaking of runes uh, they can also be used for uh, operant magic affecting your environment uh, it's uh, an enormous and complex uh, system that's available to you um, you can use them for just about anything you can think of so what do you use them for if you don't mind me asking. Um, everything except the fraudulent thing right, <laughs> right. <laughs> wink that's wink yeah, that that's. I can't. I. <laughs> there are so many times, and you, when you see people, you watch TV, you you see the TV preacher, and he's up there selling a complete line of bull, you know, and you, and it's just, I need a new jet plane, you know, and at that point, you sh everybody should be turning this off, um, but they don't, and he gets the jet plane, or two or three. And he has the $5,000 custom-made suits living in a mansion. And I've looked at that, and I'm just like, that looks like such good money. <laughs> you right. know, it, it's always nicer to have money than not. Right. Money only gets really important when you don't have any. You know, that's when, that's when money mm -hmm. is important. But you look at it, and you go, I would like that $10 million income that that guy has. Um, I just can't do it. I can't stop laughing. You got to tell people <coughs> idiotic things, you know, with absolute sincerity. You got to put up with the idea that uh, old retired people living on Social Security are sending you a check for money they really need for medicine, right? Or, or to eat. That's part of the deal. That's what's going to happen. I. Uh, so again, I so ask. What, what do you use them? <laughs> I, do you I use them. I use them for divination. I use them for uh, magical work of just about any type you can think of. Um, How often do you use them? Um, I guess that depends on whether you mean actively or passively. I have things set up. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you you could. Usually they're termed bind runes, but you can call them a talisman right. or an amulet mm -hmm. that uh, you know are constantly being used. Can you explain the difference between bind runes and the regular runes that you actually use for divination? Yeah, runes. A bind rune is when you combine <coughs> different runes, uh, literally draw them together so that you're binding the different energies together to a purpose. Kind of okay. like Bluetooth. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go there. We're gonna go there. Because you wanted to talk about he, he, so, he, he wants to have so this would conversation. You please, would you please okay, talk is, about is, Bluetooth right is now? That, do you know is who that, Bluetooth is? Do you know who Bluetooth is? Who Bluetooth is? Who? Uh, the Bluetooth. The Bluetooth. The yes. Bluetooth. Harold Bluetooth. Yes. Can you explain Bluetooth and where Bluetooth comes from for the individuals? that are listening to us right well, now. Well, chances are somebody Club, busted him in the Club face Soda. once and killed a tooth, and it just turned so colors. I, I have a story. So in Bluetooth, what I heard, loves blueberries. And he eats blueberries constantly to where his <laughs> teeth were stained blue. And he was... Oh, can you tell us who he is? Is this the true, character? Sterling? Will you, will you expand on that? Well, what did he do? I, what was his function in relation I, to history? Uh, honestly, I don't have a whole lot of information on Harold Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, I'm as, as somebody who spent a lot of time in Maine, I, I think I can tell you that the blueberry thing is not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what I've heard. More eat, bullshit. Eat More lots, bullshit. Eating lots of blueberries. Never right. had them stain my teeth that bad. Uh, but you never know. Um, as I recall, he was a, he was one more king. Right, uh, but uh, did he unite people together, the other tribes, to go go war with other other people? Honestly, I don't remember off the top okay. of my head. You see that? If you give me a list of questions ahead of time, yes, I could have been ready. Could have for the next episode. Could have dropped that right down. <laughs> um, 
but I, I honestly don't remember. Just bring it on in. You want to bring it in? Water there. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. So, so now that we went through the bind rune, now I could talk about the actual rune. I could probably. And the difference between the two. I could probably find you a picture of a bind rune in, in the one, of these, one of these here books. So, for according to what I what I read was, uh, there we go. Yes, you're putting two together and creating one large rune. Um, again, it's it's not wouldn't be one large rune because there's still separate energies. That's the difference between. So, are the you symbol. marrying them? Is that what's happening? You're binding them together to you're, you're create something bigger, better, specific. Hmm. You're, you're creating something specific. Um, and there's all kinds of different uh, bind runes. Uh, the word bind has has gotten to be a, uh, in in some circles anyway, to be kind of a, a bad word of you know evil magic. Mm. I'm binding them, and uh, that's really not what uh, that is. It's simply blending the energies for a specific goal. You know, the, the same way you would. Yeah, whatever it is. If you were if you were going to put together an altar to do a certain kind of a spell, mm -hmm. okay, and you were working in a hermetic tradition, you would have certain colors present, you would have certain items present, fragrances present, because they all bore onto you, your goal. Uh, you're not making a new fragrance, you're not making a new mm -hmm. color, but you're putting these energies together. But in various forms, in right? In various yes. forms. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, um, what is the blank rune? Okay, I do want to get into that. I like that. yes. Okay. Dun dun dun. Dun dun Okay. Thanks, is this thing on? Uh, way back in the uh, early '80s, I'm not sure exactly when, a gentleman by the name of Ralph Blum put together the highly financially su successful. Uh, enterprise of the Book of Runes, which uh, had, had a little book, tiny book, purple. And, yep, and I have this. had its had its own little rune set in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little stolen and, from me. Um, he knew absolutely nothing about runes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> really, nothing whatsoever. Um, he is. I haven't seen the interview, but I've heard it quoted. Uh, where he said I was mostly trying to take the I Ching, which is something that he knew about, right. and try to put it Merge into it. this, There's okay, no which sense. is absolutely insane. Two totally different yeah. Two different and things. And yeah. And I'd, I'd rather try to come up with a unified field theory than try to make those <laughs> two work. Right. Um, and the blank rune was everything else I haven't covered in my in these. <laughs> Okay, that's that's what it was, and also because now I had twenty five runes, right. it made a nice, neat thing I could tuck in on top of my book instead of having a blank, you know, empty spot where they'd rattle around. Wow, a complete mess. And, I, and how would this blank uh, rune be used in his in his book? Badly. Um, <laughs> it, it's 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 kind of a anything that you would want to fill in, right? You'd want to fill in with. Um, okay, it it would be like having a tarot card with a tarot deck with a couple of blank wow. cards, a couple of jokers. Just yeah, you know. Well, not even <laughs> so that because there's no <laughs> symbology. Yeah, yeah, there's no symbology. It's just blank. It's just Damn. blank. It's just simply filler. blank. It's like I say, he he made I'm sure a lot of money out of them. It sells supposedly very well. He's come out with a bunch of different editions. Um, so he's gonna be angry. Well, he can he can be angry. I, I quite frankly, I I have to admit that that was how I got introduced to runes. As so was I. And I used them with his book for about five minutes, nine months. Right. And I was yes. like, "There's something terribly wrong with this. It simply does not fit. It doesn't doesn't work." And I went out looking for other sources and I found them uh, so you know I have to say thank you Ralph for raising the consciousness of of runes uh, 
I'm I'm glad you made some money. You know, I don't really be you know begrudge him with that. Um, but <laughs> but there's nothing really traditional or anything with uh, the interpretations in his book or anything, and and I I do not recommend that that you use his use his stuff. Okay, thank you. Hmm. You know, so don't use it. I, I would recommend not. And again, if it works for you, you know, I've seen people do things that are completely incomprehensible to me that seem to work for them. And I'm not going to tell them they got to stop. It's subjective, right? It's, it depends on, you know, whether it's working, it's that, not working. And even if you told them to stop, they're not yeah, going to listen wait, anyway. So, I, right. actually, see, I don't, I, in this case, I don't consider it subjective, okay? Hmm. But I don't consider it my right to try to correct you. You know, right. if this works for you and you are happy with it, okay. Good for you. I'm not going to chase. Own. I'm not right. going to chase you around and tell you that you're wrong and, you know, that but, I've got the right thing. But you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, but but, but, <laughs> but I, it doesn't wrong. mean I'll change my opinion of what you're doing. Right. You know, I, I still think that anyone that's following those books of his, you know, it probably is not working that well. But I, I have another question. I don't know how to pronounce this correctly, but this one right here. Can you? What? The, the not, not his. Not his. Yes, the reversal, because a lot of readers don't, don't use that. No, it doesn't reverse very well. <laughs> there you go. Is. Can you just explain what that is? Can you say that word for us? Okay, I will try. You have to remember that the names for... Uh, the runes that you will find are in Proto-German, and I'm pretty sure there weren't very many voice recorders at the time. Wow. So, uh, actually, you can, if you want to chase around the internet a bit, you can find uh, Edward Thorson pronouncing these things. Wow, okay. And Edward Thorson has a, a doctorate in Germanic studies and has done great scholastic work on this sort of thing and i would recommend you know take a look and find that if you're if it's really important to you yes that you pronounce it a certain way um for people who don't know who that is um thorson is my go-to for anything runes he's the, the man that knows this stuff so please check out thorson and read his books and follow him on the internet also known as stephen flowers there you go. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's probably the, the scholastic root of the, uh, at least the American modern uh, runic work that, that goes on. There's a lot more uh, that hasn't been translated very well uh, or at all that you can find. Should you speak German, uh, go Danke. for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you... That's about as far That's as I know. That's about it. Mach schnell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah. really interesting that the Germans have uh, really kind of perpetuated the ancient, whether it be these ideas or, or, or just just esoterics in general. I mean, the concepts of, of, of you know, different ancients that the tradition of germanic uh mysticism is long and rich um if you you can go back to medieval times and find bases of this that were done uh, in germany um, of course germany looked a little bit different back then there was a, a great big scattering of different principalities but uh they always had had that sort of thing i think it was the mindset, the occult mindset, that helped make Germany such a force for so long in modern physics, because you had to get beyond what you see, what makes sense to your senses. And if you ever study modern physics, you'll find that that whole idea goes out the window fairly quickly. Yeah, so, if you can't accept the fact that uh, your body really isn't there and it's mostly empty space anyway, then little particles that <laughs> that are <laughs> vibrate, bind, bind yeah. together. Very, 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 very yes. hard to sit there and look at it and go, 
can I get through this? Seems I, like it's there. I get it. You know? So, right. uh, yeah, so German mysticism has a large tradition. There was a big uh, runic renewal in the early, early 1900s. Uh, part of it was uh, led by a gentleman called Guido von Liszt, who went blind, uh, and in this period of blindness, uh, said that he received a revelation of a runic system, the Armanin system, which again is another different, totally different system from what I use. And that was the basis of a great deal of uh, Germanic studies in, uh, in runes that lasted 30, 40 years. You know, and again, if you speak German, if you can read German, there's a lot of it there. Did it cure his blindness? Uh, he got his sight back. I don't remember the details of it. We were, we were, we, what was it that we were talking uh, about that was that has that same mythology within it about someone studying? You need their sight back. Ancient, right? Ancient mysticism and received his sight back. You know, yeah. things that things that I have read that go along that path is where you have somebody who throws them into the study, you know, the only thing that I can come back with is their third eye opens, they become more aware, Re right. becomes unblind, becomes, becomes unblind, and I think that in those instances, those people who study very in depth, that does seem to happen at some, some point, sometime, you well, know, I don't think all the time. <laughs> with, with Von List, it wasn't an ancient uh, mysticism, because it all originated with him. And what happened with what he saw in his visions, mm. it, it does not correlate with anything ancient. But even so, he, he's doing something so great where he's having visions. So mm -hmm. he's tapping into something. Something's going on. Something's basically. going on. Correct. But, but we, we, we also do know that when you lose something like your sight, of course, you are... Everything else becomes amplified. Uh, not so much that, but your approach to everything is very different. Your approach to everything. The the simple exercise of not speaking. Yes. And just listening. Yes. So that you listen to the person and are not doing what we always tend to do, which is getting ready to say what we're gonna say. You know? Mm -hmm. I've I've got the rebuttal, the reinforcement. Waiting, waiting to right. I've, and you're not I've, listening. I've got the special story that's gonna make me seem clever. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but if you're just listening and you're not gonna say anything your approach is very different. Uh, if you have lost your sight, your approach to everything is going to be very, very different. And that may be what opens them up to something like this. Although heaven knows there's plenty of blind people that haven't had revelations. Right. So, you know, statistically, it's not a really productive path. <laughs> yes. <You know? laughs> we recommend it. I, I would not do that voluntarily, no. <laughs> Don't go blind. Yeah, don't go blind. Um, out of all of the Edda poetic, is there any specific saga or any specific story that stuck to you that actually changed your life in certain, some certain way? Um, well, certainly the Havamal, uh, which, again, is the story of, uh, includes the study, a story of Odin's gaining the runes. But it has an awful lot of other things in there in addition to it. A whole lot of it looks an awful lot of, like the biblical book of Proverbs. You know, it's it's smart things you ought to do and dumb things you shouldn't. You know, um, it 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 all uh, it all all worked very nicely for me. I haven't done. Uh, I have a friend who moved back to Germany, and she was my kind of go-to gal for sagas because you know she would first of all read them in a more authentic language right and uh, was very very big on them uh, the Volsung saga is mm. very interesting um, part of it talks about how Odin uh, worked with the Volsung family and the thing that you have to realize about Odin and, and I mean this very sincerely, is that you should never assume that he has your best in mind, okay? Because he has something he's trying to do. 
very and that, self. And that he's comes very for, self-serving. Well, no, he's serving something bigger than himself, okay. but you are not bigger than what he's serving. Okay, uh, you need to approach that. Nowhere does anybody with any sense claim that Odin is a the version savior. of the the savior, the no. omnipotent, omnibenevolent. I'm going to make sure you Definitely never not. you get a scab on your knees, kind of guy. He's not. Um, he he will he will use you. He has a, he has a mission. Uh, Odin's mission is to delay Ragnarok. Yes. <laughs> Ragnarok <laughs> is the uh, it's it's uh, it is apocalyptic in nature, but it's a little bit different. He is working to delay that, and he will do whatever it takes to delay that. That's an interesting point of view because it, he's not working to stop it because he knows it can't be stopped. He knows he's going to lose so is this. He, is he yes. working toward figuring out his own place in? He, oh no, that? he knows it. He knows it's already been. It's it's, it's all you said, can right? you can read it. Yes, you Ragnar can read Ragnar's it. He will die on Ragnarok. Odin will be killed, um, and he and is, he's fine with that. I don't think he's overly I don't think he's fine with it. I, 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 don't think, like, I don't think he can change that. Real. He can't this, change but he's that. Dealing with, he's dealing with his place in that yes. position. He's, yes. he's dealing with delaying it for a lot of reasons. But he is working to delay Ragnarok. And that is his first concern. And what it takes to do that is we really don't know. Okay. Well, he knows. He's supposed well, to know, right? What, what are you going to do to stop next Wednesday from coming? Right. Okay. I don't day. have the answer. Call, for a different day. Call it Tuesday. Go to sleep. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, Tuesday I don't have the answer for yeah. for what he's trying to do exactly. I, that that's a very good analogy because if you told me what are you doing from preventing next Wednesday from happening, I'm going to say. What can I do from preventing next Wednesday How? from happening? But what can I do to make myself prepared for next Wednesday happening? Right. So you, I can kind of you, understand that. You've accepted the inevitability that Wednesday will be it's here. It's happening. <laughs> okay. Odin has accepted the inevitability of Ragnarok happening, but not when. Hmm. So he wants to prolong as much as possible. Yes. Yes, and this is, this is what he's working on. This is, what does that entail? I haven't the faintest idea. Magnus Opum. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. He's working to put that off. Um, that's, that, that's the thing you have to remember. And <coughs> he, do, he does, not, his first priority is not making sure that you get enough you know, chop nuts on your hot fudge Sunday. Yeah. He has a dedicated mission. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, and you have to remember that Odin is not straightforward. No, he, he does have a forked tongue, correct? Comedy? <laughs> I think more forked tongue. Like, he, 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 he'll he tell you the truth that's sweet to, as long as it serves him, he'll right? He'll tell you a flat out lie. Yeah, okay. okay. I was trying to be nice no, to him. don't, don't. Let's be let's be honest. Yeah, okay. he's got a forked tongue. De deception is a very natural thing for Odin. A hundred percent. You know, and this is something you have to understand about him if you're going to work with him. Hmm. Yes. So, so dealing with Odin would be understanding that you're not necessarily going to get. Straight the answer. Truth or a straight answer. Right. But you're gonna get real. Oh, real is very is very Odin. Let me. And get, you're gonna have to interpret what that real is. Sometimes you find out at the end. You, let me tell what you real is. a story or a part of a story. Okay, give you an idea. Um, Odin is trying. Oh, Odin was trying to recover uh, the sac the sacred mead. Okay, the mead that gave wisdom. Okay, it had been, it had been taken by a giant who lived in a, in a cave in a mountain, and Odin had to, had to go get that. Now, 
the way with the, the the Marvel comic approach, of course, is that you go in like gangbusters and you know have a big strike force and beat the heck out of everybody. That's not very Odin. Um, Odin went to the mountain, and he did things like bored a hole in the mountain through to the cavern so he could turn himself into a snake and crawl through it. And once he got in there, the giant's daughter was guarding the sacred mead. So he seduced her <laughs> over course. a period of time right? so that she would give it to him. Hmm. Okay. Notice he didn't go in there and, you know, chloroform the girl and take the stuff out the door. No, no. Did she give it to him? Uh, well, there's different translations. <laughs> <laughs> I think. What do you mean by give it? <laughs> <laughs> give, give the mead. The mead. The mead. Oh. Yes. And the Not mead the is. Fruit? Did and he the mead it? is. <laughs> well, uh, he took it, swallowed it whole. Ooh. Out of the three containers that w that it was in, really turned weird. himself into an eagle and flew back to Asgard and regurgitated it so that it could be used. Ooh. Wow, that's some talent. Okay, you, it, yeah. this this is not a straightforward guy. This is not Zeus saying no. you've got two days to uh -huh. do what I tell you, or here comes the lightning bolt. This is the, this is how Odin works. This is how Odin works. Um, consider that uh, Woten, the Germanic form, is much less of a warrior, okay? Much more of a sorcerer. Um, but we've all seen that in tales of sorcerers, they don't do great sorcery. Merlin never sat there and did some big whopping whatever and things went on. And Wotan never really did either. It's, and he's kind of a, a model that Tolkien used for Gandalf. Yes. Uh, which, interestingly enough, Gandalf <coughs> means wand elf, if you want to translate that. And translation is important with Tolkien because he mm -hmm. was a professor of languages. Yes, and he says Sumerian. So... If we look at Gandalf, what great acts of magic did he do? He really didn't. I mean, no, I mean, he's more of a leader than anything. Fought the Belrog. He was right. He was, you shut not pass. He, he was. He but was he did, the he progenitor of he, this. He group. didn't fight the Balrog. He knocked the arch out from under him. True. It's true. But then they got down, like when they were right. And that and that that was the one thing that I can think of that he really did that was he came back from. magical, you know, as far as a sorceress combat thing. He left himself, and I think that's what we were talking about earlier, he sacrificed himself and he came back himself. as and Gandalf the White. Gandalf right. the White. Right. Yeah. So he ascended, correct? He had an ego death sacrifice. and he ascended. Ascension. He had an ego death and he ascended. Which I think, which I think that is the absolute, I mean, whether you talk about, there you go. yeah, there we go. <laughs> Whether you talk about Odin or you talk about Gandalf or whatever, I mean, the ascension is is key to the modification of your spirit or the mm -hmm. or the you know the mode of which you become. Yeah, and and you want to remember too that. For somebody that's that's following what uh, Thorson refers to as the Odian path, um, which is which he defines as being the path that emulates Odin. Uh, you're not the concept in in most pagan faiths of worship is really not there, um, as in the way that it is in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition you know uh, Thor does not want me to bow down to him Odin does not want me to sing hymns to him okay and as far as I can tell Apollo is not that interested in it either so the idea of of following a deity is very different um, we're not supplicating we're not trying to 
uh, flatter my deity into doing what I want him to, because evidently I'm a very clever chap. Um, it's more of an emulation of following the path of this, uh, more of the what would Odin do approach rather than what did Odin do. W-W-O-D. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, and, and this is very different from people that see it as a more religious path. Because Odin never said, you know, I want everybody to follow my example and come and worship at my temple. You know, Uppsala is a beautiful place this time of year. None of that. There, there's no looking for followers. Uh, as far as I can tell, in any of the sagas I've read, uh, Odin doesn't give a hoot who's following. No, he does his own, right? He he's he has something to do, <laughs> and yeah. he's taking care of that. So it's a, it's a bit different in that way. It's a bit different. So if you're going to uh, follow Odin, remember that's what you're doing. You're trying to do <clears throat> things the way Odin did things with the principles. Of, of Odin uh, rather than necessarily seducing the maiden so he can get the booze and hit the road. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> ah, yes. Can you, Although that the makes old a, ways. That makes a good weekend, you know? Right. What can I tell you? Since you're talking about Odin, can you uh, touch on his sleep? Did he sleep for a certain time period? I think you're confusing Marvel Comics with that. I was trying to bring it in. I yeah, tried. I tried, yeah. guys. Yeah, don't, don't, don't confuse the Marvel universe right. with the. Don't go there. Uh, yeah, don't, 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 do, don't do that. I know. You know. He's gonna smack it's, you next time. And yeah, you can, you go ahead and do that. Yes, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> permitted. It's okay. We're, we do. We're okay with that. It's, it's like trying to bring Disney into the no into the Hercules mythos. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's real bad. It doesn't or doesn't really work. Or Pocahontas. That was even worse. You know, or, or which I've still never seen. It's, it was a it was a late Disney film, you know. They're all the same. But um, yeah, so I, I don't know. Uh, questions about questions. Anybody have any questions right now? We're gonna read them off. Uh, we're gonna... We have a, a question about what is the linked chain on the table? What is the oh. The chain. So the, I think the, the their connection with the Nordic mythos and in um, you know the Viking the days of the Viking um, brotherhood was uh, you you lived and you died with your brother and you went to war with your brother. Um, if we want to kind of have that same link with me with masonry, it's from masonry back in the day. It was that. Uh, now it's more, you know, speculative. It's not as hardcore as it was back in the day, oh, but okay. now it's a little okay. more speculative. And some people get it, not everybody does. So that's just my view on it. The connection that I see with masonry and with these ancient kind of mythos is the, the brotherhood within masonry the brotherhood within the ancient mythos of standing side by side with your brothers and whether it be fighting for whatever it was that you were fighting for or standing side by side with your brothers and fighting for the ideas and the ideals of what it is today, that's the connection. We have another question. We have another question. Well, I'm, yes. I'm going to let you read it. I'm going to scroll down. Oh, I just lost it. Oh. Mm. Do you remember what it was? Too much technology. Yes. Mm. yes, I do. Okay, he remembers. Yeah, the question was about do I, do I use the physical stances or what's sometimes called runic yoga, which is, that's just a, that's a bad term. <laughs> um, I, I have used them. They were uh, created by some of the people around Guido von Liszt in the beginning of the 1900s. And uh, basically what that is, is you're taking a stance similar to the physical drawing of the rune. And in and doing so, you're trying to make yourself more receptive to that energy. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, 
Futhark, out Edward Thorson's book on a handbook of rune magic. And this is Behave. this is the old one. So you won't uh, it'll be a little bit different cover. Has got some good stuff in there, which is probably too small to see, but you guys can hold this up for everybody to oh, see. I see what you mean. So we'll try and zoom in on this really quick. Let's see if I hold it up. And then. And then. And it's all right here. And I'm going to let you guys see the front cover. You probably won't find it with that front cover anymore. That's, yes, go by the name. That's an oldie. My book has a different cover. And then. And then. And there's also and then. there was also a uh, a system of uh, hand gestures, which again was the same thing. You're trying to take your fingers and hands and make runic symbols with them. Uh, like I say, these were developed uh, in Germany uh, after Guido von Liszt and Thorson adapted them because they were using the Armenian runes, which are different than than these. But he adapted them quite nicely. Uh, in Futhark. And c can I ask, why did different styles come up besides the cultures? Like, what, what made them say, hey, you know, wherever we're at, whether we know of another style or not, why sh we should do this now? We came about using this. You're asking why different uh, runic systems evolved? Correct, yes. Okay, have you ever read, read Chaucer? No. Okay, that's just verging into Middle English, and it's incredibly challenging to read. And if you go back much further than that, it's unintelligible. I see what you're saying, where they have like the broken English almost. It the the it's, language changes, yes. the lettering evolves. Um, if you tried to read Beowulf in the <laughs> original, you, you would consider it a completely different language, and you would be right. right. You would be right. Uh, I've tried. Times, yeah, times. Have, <laughs> it's like broken, really. Times have changed. The language changed. Context and uh, remember that there was very little in the way of some place to write this stuff down. As you said earlier, that, yeah, like so, content for the ages is different. Yeah, yeah. If you look at some of the sagas that are out there, and uh, you will be stunned to realize that people memorized these things. And you're talking of hundreds and hundreds of stanzas. And this is what they did. And I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> I, I really can't. But this is, this is what they did. Uh, and as you can imagine, it was not handed off perfectly. You know, it, it simply, mm -hmm. simply couldn't be. So, yeah, they, they evolved. The, the, uh, the most common ones, the common Futharks, the Elder Futhark, the younger, which was more around the Viking era, so when Ragnar Lodbrok was running around, Doing they, his thing. they would have been using that. Um, the Armenian one is very modern, as I said, coming out in the 1900s. And there were a couple other systems uh, with, with different names, the Frisian system, uh, the Anglo-Saxon system with different numbers of, of runes in them and different runes. Uh, usually you can look at it and say, oh, okay, I can see where this now, came would, from. But would, they're, they're would, you, would you use a, a certain s system of runes over another one for different types of things? Uh, I've mostly worked in uh, the Elder Futhark, so I really couldn't say okay. uh, how well Frisian runes work uh, against that. I don't even know anybody that works in anything right. but Elder Futhark. Futhark. Yeah. That's what I hear. That's what I see all the time, and that's what I was first turned on to. So. Yeah, yeah, it, it's the most common one by far. Okay. Well, so this is where we are going to wrap it up. Um, we're probably going to break this up into two pieces. It's a very long piece, so we'll have a part one and part two, so that way you guys could enjoy on your own leisure. Um, Sterling, do you have any any websites or any areas where people can reach you and you know gather more information? Yes, uh, I have a website up. It's runester.com. 
And that's R U N E S T Y R. R U N E S T Y R, runester.com. Get a hold of Sterling. Um, we have uh, Esotericon coming up. Make sure you check that out. Go to keepersoftheword.net. We have a lot of new merch, not a lot of new things on there. Um, right now, we, we have a lodge event tomorrow, 4th of July, here. If anybody's up for coming and hanging out, it's a potluck type thing. You're more than welcome to join us. Um, um, brothers in business, you know, you know I want to thank uh, uh, Bobby from Cigar, your cigar Assessor Bobby. Uh, Bobby. Bobby. Cigars and more in El Segundo. Um, want to perform as G, you know? I don't understand what he's saying. He's retarded. Uh, <laughs> one World Stage and Screen. Indigo Beehive Creative. Carl Hearn. Carl with Hearn. Some, from uh, the, with uh, the, uh, the... The this. Memento Mori Beard Oil. Absolutely. Uh, Want to thank Samson Technologies, Indigo Beehive Creative for the production, and LA Harbor Lodge for letting us use this lodge and do our thing. Charlie's. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank, thank you, Sterling. You. Greatly appreciate you. Thank and you, guys. Until next time. <laughs>